Hello AP Biology. Welcome to the first video in a series that will go over each of the topics in all eight of the units in the AP Bio curriculum. These videos will serve a couple main purposes. First, if you happen to miss the live lecture, you can watch its video on your own time. And second, you'll be able to use them to review the concepts in each of the topics. Some of these videos include a single topic, while others, like this one, will have more than one. Multiple topics are linked together if they're short, related to each other, or both. This video will include topics 1.1 and 1.2, structure of water and hydrogen bonding, and elements of life. At their most basic, living things are simply a complex collection of a huge number of chemical reactions. For example, in a typical human cell, up to a billion chemical reactions are taking place every second. The molecules that are participating in those reactions behave the way they do because of two things. The atoms that make up the molecule and the way in which those atoms are assembled. While there are many kinds of molecules that are necessary for living things, one in particular is of extra special importance, water. Water is pretty simple. It's two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. You may recall from previous science classes that hydrogen is a simple atom with a single proton at its nucleus. Oxygen, on the other hand, has a much more massive nucleus with eight protons and eight neutrons. Another special characteristic of oxygen is its electronegativity. Like fluorine and chlorine, oxygen has a strong pull on the electrons it shares in covalent bonds with atoms like hydrogen. This pull on electrons results in an uneven sharing of them and produces a dipole moment where the oxygen possesses a slightly negative charge and the hydrogens each have a positive charge. Water's polarity is the result of higher electron density around the oxygen region of the molecule. It is this polarity that grants water its emergent properties. Because individual water molecules are polar, one water molecule's negative region, the oxygen, can be attracted to the positive region, the hydrogens, of another water molecule. This water-to-water -water attraction via hydrogen bonds is called cohesion. In liquid water, the hydrogen bonds between a single water molecule and up to four neighboring water molecules are transient, forming, breaking, and reforming rapidly. This property of water can be observed in the fact that rain falls as drops of water with sextillions of molecules rather than as individual molecules, or as spheroid shapes on a blade of grass. Adhesion, which is a related property, is defined as water's attraction to other charged or polar substances. Water sticking to a pane of glass in a window or morning dew collecting on the filaments of a spider's web are great demonstrations of water's adhesiveness. The adhesion of water to the inside walls of a graduated cylinder, forming a meniscus, is easily observable as well. Within the transport vessels of a plant, long chains of water molecules stretch up through the height of the stem or trunk. They stick to the inside walls of the xylem and to one another, allowing for water to be pulled up through the plant from soil to stem to branch to leaf, ultimately into the atmosphere. Additionally, because of cohesion, water behaves as if a film covers its surface in a phenomenon called surface tension. Water doesn't gain or lose thermal energy easily. Specific heat is a measure of how much energy is required to heat up a mass of a substance by a given temperature, typically one degree Celsius. Let's take a look at this example. In the first column, we see a list of a variety of substances of equal mass, one gram, each being subjected to one unit of energy, in this case, 
a single calorie. By how much does one gram of gold increase in temperature with one calorie? 31 degrees Celsius. Silver increases by 18 degrees Celsius and cement by just over 5 degrees. But water, on the other hand, only increases by a single degree Celsius. Because of the relative difficulty with which water can be heated, its high specific heat is important in moderating temperatures. This is true for animals and plants that rely on the conversion of water from a liquid to a gas to help maintain their temperatures. On a much larger scale, bodies of water on Earth help to absorb incoming heat from the sun. These graphs show the annual average temperature changes for two different cities. For the city on the left, we can observe an annual temperature swing of about 25 degrees. In the other city, the difference from the coldest month to the warmest, on average, is nearly 45 degrees. What's the difference? Seattle is the city on the left, very close to a body of water, Puget Sound, and not all that far from the Pacific Ocean. The other city is Spokane, much farther away with no large bodies of water nearby to help absorb heat. Water is great at dissolving substances. These hydrophilic materials are surrounded by a collection of water molecules called a hydration shell, solvation shell, or sphere of hydration. When ionic substances, like sodium chloride, dissolve, water surrounds positively charged particles, the sodium ions, in a manner that the oxygen atoms are oriented toward it. Water's hydrogen atoms are attracted to the negatively charged chloride ions. Even substances that don't ionize, like glucose, readily dissolve in water due to all of the partial charges present in the molecule. DNA and RNA have a charged sugar phosphate backbone, making them dissolve in water as well. Even large molecules like proteins can dissolve in water. As a matter of fact, even a cell's cytosol is a solution, with thousands of different kinds of solutes dissolved in an aqueous environment. Finally, let's take a look at how water behaves as its temperature changes. Substances expand when they warm and contract when they cool, and water is no different, up to a point. This explains why structures like sidewalks and bridges are built in sections with expansion joints. They allow them to contract and expand as they cool and heat. When liquid water cools and approaches its freezing point, it contracts and reaches its greatest density at 4 degrees Celsius. At that temperature, because the hydrogen bonds begin to stabilize, the distance between individual water molecules increases, and between 4 degrees and 0 degrees Celsius, water expands. Solid water, ice, is less dense than liquid water, allowing it to float. Ice floating is probably not a revelation, as you've seen a glass of ice water before. So why is this phenomenon so important to life? A solid layer of floating ice acts as an insulation layer for the aquatic organisms beneath it. During cold days or seasons, when the air temperature is well below the freezing point of water, and the surface of a body of water is frozen, the liquid water beneath can be a nice, relatively toasty 4 degrees for the organisms in it. Most of a living thing is comprised of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. The first four alone in that list make up 96% of the matter of an organism. Carbon's nature allows it to form up to four covalent bonds with other atoms, or collections of atoms. Carbon can form single, double, triple covalent bonds and can link together to make chain-like structures, ring structures, or a combination of chain and ring. Before we take a look at some important functional groups, which act as reaction sites for organic molecules, I want to use this molecule to demonstrate 
an abbreviated way of sketching carbon-based molecules. This molecule is the vitamin beta-carotene. Many of its carbon and hydrogen atoms are omitted to simplify the illustration. The lines represent covalent bonds, single and double. When the bonds connect, a carbon atom is present. Like here, for example. The carbon atom has a single bond on the left and a double on the right. The missing fourth bond is to a hydrogen atom. There's also a carbon atom here in the ring. To the upper left is a single bond, and another single bond is directly beneath it. The missing two bonds, because remember, carbon forms four covalent bonds, are these hydrogen atoms. This form of abbreviation allows chemists to avoid having to draw in every single carbon and hydrogen atom. Let's take a look at some common functional groups. These are the collections of atoms bonded to carbon in organic molecules that participate in chemical reactions. Hydroxyl groups are made of a single oxygen and single hydrogen. They are extremely common in organic molecules and participate in a variety of reactions, like those that build macromolecules. Carbonyl groups feature an oxygen atom double bonded to a carbon, and a carboxyl group is basically a combination of carbonyl and hydroxyl groups. Amino groups are easily distinguishable by their nitrogen atom. They are important in every amino acid. You may see these groups in their charged or uncharged form with a proton dissociated, but they are the same for our purposes. Sulfhydryl groups are obvious as well, thanks to the presence of sulfur. They're found in a couple kinds of amino acids. Phosphate groups are negatively charged and possess four oxygen atoms and, of course, a phosphorus atom. Methyl groups are those that have a carbon atom with three hydrogens, each single bonded to that carbon. As we progress through this unit, and a bit in some future ones, we're going to see many examples of these functional groups and we'll explore their importance at those times. Carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen are in each of the four macromolecules of life, carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. The other major atoms in living things, however, are found only in certain ones. Nitrogen is present in all amino acids, and therefore proteins, thanks to the presence of the amino group in each amino acid. Nitrogen is also part of each of the nucleotides making up DNA and RNA. Phosphorus, because of the phosphate group, is found in the backbone of nucleic acids by the millions and billions. It's also important in the construction of cell membranes as it's a critical part of the phospholipids used to build them. ATP, ADP, and AMP all have three, two, and one phosphate group, respectively. As mentioned before, sulfur is present in a couple of amino acids, namely methionine and cysteine. All of these elements in living things as well as the ones found in relatively much smaller amounts, like iron, calcium, and zinc, cycle between living things and the environment. They are commonly present in the environment in ionic form or as part of other compounds. These matter cycles will be explored in much more depth and detail in the ecology unit at the end of the year. That concludes the presentation on these topics, so until next time, take care.